Good evening. This evening at Sammy's Pizza Restaurant, I'm going to be talking about six pages from Jung's Red Book for Our Time, Searching for Soul Under Postmodern Conditions by Mary Stein and Thomas Arst, editors. And I'll specifically be talking about the last six pages of an essay by Belomir Popovich called, I am as I am not, the role of imagination in construing the dialogical self. Now this is a behind the scenes reading, so it's going to have all of my uh, flubs. And Matt D asked me if 21 is too young for young. I guess that would depend on you, Matt, and that's not good. My power just went kaflooey somehow. Hold on. There. And why that happened, I do not know, and I apologize for the interruption. Okay, so tonight with my artist friends especially, I'm going to be talking about these six pages from uh, Dr. Popovich's essay. And so I thought in order to simplify it for my offsite followers, I would read these six pages in now so that you can have a sense of what I'm interested in. And you can also find these pages as marked up by Skip in uh, the Dropbox under the subfolder called Handouts, and then a subfolder called 110419, which is today's date. Right, and I agree with Grenade, Matt, but I'm not going to respond to uh, comments for a few minutes here so I can read this in as I'm preparing for tonight's meeting. <clears throat> so I'm going to begin with a quote from Dr. Jung. Image and meaning are identical, and as the first takes shape, so the latter becomes clear. Actually, the pattern needs no interpretation. It portrays its own meaning. <laughs> Tell that to John Verbeke. Unquote. <laughs> now, going, <laughs> I'm sorry, I cracked myself up. <laughs> going on. Let me, uh, I'll reread that for clarity. All right, so the quote is, and let me just double check the footnote here. Okay, the footnote for this quote is from an essay of Dr. Jung called On the Nature of the Psyche, Collected Works, Volume 8, Paragraph 402. <clears throat> Here's the quote. Image and meaning are identical, and as the first takes shape, so the latter becomes clear. Actually, the pattern needs no interpretation. It portrays its own meaning. Unquote. With those words, Jung encapsulated the phenomenological account of imagination as portrayal or as appearance with hermeneutic account as meaning. Portrayal captures the essence of image as that which is portrayed as it is portrayed. In that sense, image portrays itself in itself. And this particular portrayal is not random or accidental. The portrayal goes with a precise meaning, which is depicted in the very portrayal. If I am right, what Jung referred to as the image could be understood as a mode of presentation, portrayal, more than as a content of the process of imagination. And the mode of presentation or portrayal is essentially 
something at variance and therefore possible. A given mode of portrayal is always just one of several possible modes. In each new portrayal, with every new image, new meaning is expressed. After all, it is the soul that is polysemic, that is multiple meanings, consisting of images as it was inferred by Jung. The world of my soul is the many formed and changing. From the pages of Liber Novus, we may infer that Jung recognizes in imagination the capacity for letting new images shape, portray his understanding of himself and of the other. This power was not conveyed by visual images, but by spoken messages. The emergent meanings in and through language and in dialogue. By replacing a visual model of the image with a verbal, Jung affirms the poetical role of imagination, that is, its ability to say one thing in terms of another, or to say many things at the same time, thereby construing or creating something new. This poetical imagination comes into play when a new meaning emerges from the literal meanings or from ossified interpretations and understandings. In a certain sense, this is a two-way process. What is unknown to present consciousness becomes known and familiar, and what is known and familiar becomes foreign. In appropriating other or new meaning into one perspective, one is also misappropriating a previous perspective in order to open oneself to another meaning. Here again, let us remember that the poetical imagination is above all a dialogical imagination, open-ended, paradoxical, open-minded, polysemic, erratic, versatile, and prepared to dialogue with what is not itself, with its other, greeting the difference in order to learn from it, as it is hinted in the etymological sense of dialegen, welcoming and embracing the difference in order to learn from it. The emergence of new images and patterns of meaning is an activity of the permanent yet never ending othering of any self as well as of others. Those aspects of imagination that it that it is othered that it is uttered rather than seen and in a process of producing semantic innovations certainly represented a healing factor that helped Jung to quote with his inner daemons. Interaction with spoken images could represent crucial aspects in analysis if it is seen as a dialogical interaction between the imaginative intentionality of a patient and of an analyst. Let me put it this way. Analysis involves a dialogue, intersubjective process, whereby a self, the analysand, comes to know itself better by narrating itself in another, by narrating itself to another, the analyst, more comprehensively and truthfully than it had narrated itself before. Now, I just mentioned, before I go on here, that Dr. Jung's paragraphs were always very long, and Dr. Edinger observed that he meant them as uh, psychic images. He meant his paragraphs as psychic images in all of his writing, not only in the Red Book. And so when you get into a Jungian paragraph that's three pages long, uh, you can find yourself quite lost. But um, that's the technique to portray the psyche or the other or the self as something other or different. Right. 
thank you, Miles and Matt and Grenad for continuing the conversation. All right, so I've read two pages. I'm going to read on here. Instead of saying that it was either Jung or some psychic image that was conducting a conversation with the other side, it seems more appropriate to say that dialogue conducted itself. As such, dialogue becomes a happening that takes place between embodied subjects who know no certainty as to the outcome of their conversation. The genuine dialogue is conversation that is not conducted by the intention of, or the will of either of either or the will of either actant, and therefore it is never the one they wanted to conduct. The understanding of the self and the other has its own meaning beyond the conscious conceptual language and its intentional acts. And this is based on a dialogical hermeneutic and understanding of spoken images of which not only soul, but even the conscious I is one. In dialogical encounters, the sense of oneself, of the other or of the world is challenged and disputed, producing the effect of forcing one to see oneself and the other differently and from a new perspective. As the self as other than itself and the self in relation to others, and in this lies the transformative power of imaginal dialogues, whose purpose is to create self and subjectivity. This is, in my opinion, what is narrated in the pages of the Red Book. Let me underline once more, in Liber Novus, imagination is seen as a permanent interaction dialogue between the human subject, i.e. Jung, who imagines and the images themselves. Later on in psychological types, Jung will keep on underlying this underlying, Jung will keep on underlining this perpetual activity of the psyche. This autonomous activity of the psyche is a continually creative act. Imagination is the creative activity from which the answers to all answerable questions come. Let me reread that correctly. Imagination is the creative activity from which the answers to all answerable questions come. Imagination, especially one that is going on in dialogue, is assumed to be conscious or something other than itself, which prompts, inspires, and transforms it. And what is this something other? The answer is, the world of possibility, which is at once created and discovered by dialogical imagination. The possible is homogeneous with the soul, the unknown, the unconscious, the other. The possible is also a factor that makes a dialogue productive. A productive dialogue has the effect of forcing human subjects to see or to hear things differently from a novel perspective and in a new light. We learn from Jung that imagination is the mother of all possibilities, which fashions the bridge between the irreconcilable claims of subject and object. The role of dialogical imagination could be apprehended as a space for exploring possibilities. It is only the realm of imagination that offers the freedom to reflect on possibilities. Each image one confronts in dialogue brings new perspectives, novel possibilities to explore. Thus the possible world, possible self or possible other that is intimated is always possible in relation to the actual, i.e the actual offers resources for prefiguring the possible. And it is imagination that contemplates the possible guided by these given resources. And the other way around, it employs the possible to revision the actual. When one has freedom to imagine new possibilities in dialogue, 
one can create new images of oneself and the other. Even more, new possibilities create new realities. The psyche creates reality every day, says Jung. It creates reality ex nihilo, that is from nothing, from nowhere, and it is not bound by an original or previous reality of which it is only a weak copy. Because imagination does not copy a previous reality, it is free to produce a new reality every day. In that sense, it alters, expands, and augments one's sense of reality and reality's possibilities. In this realm of imaginal dialogues, to be possible is to be, and since it is imagination that, envis that envisages what is possible, it becomes the arbiter of experience determining and directing its course. Moreover, each new image represents yet another possibility to apprehend the unknown. This productive power of imagination lies in its ability to create something that would otherwise not be present. It is imagination that keeps otherness from slipping into the unsayable or unknown. The otherness both invites to dialogue and prompts the self or subject to engage in dialogue, as Jung learned from the spirit of the depths. Quote, I thought and spoke much of the soul. I knew many learned words for her. I had judged her and turned her into a scientific object. I did not consider that my soul cannot be the object of my judgment and knowledge much more are my judgment and knowledge the objects of my soul. Therefore, the spirit of the depths forced me to speak to my soul, to call upon her as a living and self-existing being. I had to speak to my soul as to something far off and unknown, which did not exist through me, but through whom I existed. Jung's discourse with the soul in the pages of the Red Book seeks to show that the imagination as dialogue, narrative, and poetry is the basis of subjectivity and selfhood. For Jung, a psychological hermeneutic of subjectivity has to begin with the soul rather than the individual. The individual is always contained in the soul. We are steeped in a world that was created by our own psyche. Quote, I did not contest the relative validity either of the realistic standpoint, the essay in Re, or of the idealistic standpoint, the essay in Intellectu. I would only like to unite these extreme opposites by an essay in Anima which is the psychological standpoint. We live immediately only in the world of images, unquote. The soul is articulated primarily as a basis for addressing psychological, personological, and anthropological aspects of subjectivity by way of imagination. And it opens at the same time a complementary perspective on humanity, groups, and society. Essay in Anima marks a creative split in the imagination for Jung in that it consists of the two mutually irreducible poles of the dialogical imagination of the individual subject on the one hand and the dialogical imagination of group subjects or the other. It is the case that only through some transfer from self to other via imagination that the other, which is alien and unvoiced, is brought closer. At the same time, by doing this otherness becomes the heart of selfhood, ability to, ability to converse with the self or unknown is beyond the rational mind and directed thinking, which both operate with concepts. In the world of anima mundi, Imagination is the only viable means for communicating with images. The primary datum of Jung's psychology in the Red Book 
is the image, and the image is identified with the soul psyche. Quote, image is psyche. The wealth of the soul exists in images. We who possess the image of the world possess half the world, unquote. If equipped with the imaginative sources, which allow the dialogue to happen, the human subject can transform into homo imaginator, someone able to create and explore those imaginal possibilities that emerge into existence at the crossing, dialogue between self and the other world, soul, and who is intentionally directed toward the other more than to the self. In, light, in Liber Novus, Jung shows that he has learned this lesson well. The main virtue of self-other, selfhood otherness, dialectics, is to prevent the self from claiming the place of psychological birth to be exclusively its own. This does not mean that this place is taken by the other, which would thus seek to usurp the self's birthright. The psychological birth of the subject is represented by the imagined dialogue between the two. I wish in conclusion to stress once more Jung's tacit claim, as he elaborated it in Liber Novus, that understanding as self-understanding or between individuals, group subjects, or cultures is the outcome of dialogue. It is especially true when a person wishes to inspect, comprehend, or analyze oneself. In order to understand oneself, one has to communicate with the soul, the other, the unconscious, or the unknown. That is to say, with the otherness of oneself and the otherness of the other. With the otherness of the past, or what is no more, and the otherness of the future, or what is not yet. Therefore, one has to enter into dialogue with all of those modalities of otherness and with their possibilities, which are expressed in images as images or through images. The images are the selves or the subjects stepping stones to the other than oneself as Jung learned from the spirit of the depths. Quote, you are an image of uh, you are an image of the unending world all the mysteries of becoming and passing away live in you End quote. but for jung the hermeneutic circle debars any direct route to immediate self understanding the human subject the one that starts to appear from the dialogues with the soul can only come to know itself through the hermeneutic detour of interpreting images via dialogue that is decrypting the meanings contained in visions, dreams, myths, and symbols as produced by imagination. In short, as Richard Kearney has said, quote, the shortest route from the self to itself is through the images of others. Unquote. I would add the images of the self and of the other that come face to face with each other in the realms of dialogue make the shortest route to the self, which is more than itself and less than oneself. End of, end of essay. Now I skipped the first 13 pages of that essay, but I think there are quite enough concepts <laughs> in the essay or ideas that it will keep us going tonight. Um, and uh, let's see. Matt D says, yeah, and one time I physically felt the ever-changing element of the soul, something always changing and evolving, especially when we get out of its way. Right. And you can do that by trying anything creative. It can be planting a garden or going to the kitchen store and finding uh, a dish or a pan that you wanna cook with, or it can be Sears tool department or the art store or anything like that. All those things get your 
psyche moving, your imagination. Now it says, recognizing a self and shadow within you all allows us to appreciate the self and shadow in others. Good for bridging the paradox that we are all individuals while at the same time with, while at the same time can be in unity. That says very true. We can see the deepest values of others and their communities are values we have too. The values of peace, truth, and life. Absolutely. Thanks for the reading, says Michael. Vixen says, is there a possibility of getting lost in the self-reflecting pool? Well, I think that's a possibility, yeah. And if you, um, as Dr. Edinger put it, if you pull up a fish from the unconscious that's bigger than your boat, you better cut the line and let that one go. That's the best answer. Um, and Grenade says, only until you realize that there's nothing actually there, the effect of that is paradoxical in that you find out who you really are. <laughs> That's a good, good answer, Grenade. Miles says, the images of others are the way to get to one's own self. If that is what I heard, I totally agree and I have my own example. Great. Okay, well, because we're having a, a uh, session tonight at Sammy's, I thought I'd get you started on that. As I said, um, my version of these six pages complete with Skip's markup uh, are contained in the Dropbox. So if you're a member of our Dropbox, you can find it there under the sub uh, subfolder handouts and then under the subfolder 110419, which is today's date. And um, so Twin Aquarius, you'll be able to see the playback of this in a few minutes, and you can find the reading in the Dropbox. And if you're not a member of our Dropbox, you can write to me at skip.conover at gmail.com. I don't promise to get you into the Dropbox tonight, since I have a few other things to do between now and 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Everybody should note that the United States has gone back to Standard Time over this past weekend, so we are now an hour earlier than we were before. And uh, I will see you again at 8 o'clock. Yes, info over to us says the best way to come into the unconscious is to communicate with it, um, come into contact with it. Absolutely. <laughs> if you don't communicate with it, it's just going to sit there and be a lump and someday it's going to come up and bite you when you're least expecting it. That's the way it works. Anyway, okay, I have to move on. I will be online at Sammy's again at 8 p.m. U.S. Eastern Time. I will do my best to follow the chat on my iPad if that works. Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Uh, Apple doesn't bother to give us directions on these things, so we just have to flail around until we figure it out. Anyway, peace. See you a little later.